relatively easy questions. Um, do you need answers? Okay. Hi guys, and she said I'm Sydney. Um, so I wanted to start off my presentation a little bit differently than people in the past. I'm going to start by talking about Lily's presentation from last week. Um, and the, for those of you that weren't here last week, she presented on a paper called The Projective Effect of Hyperbaric Oxygen in Ginkgo Biloba Extract on AB2535 Induced Oxidative Stress in Neuronal Ectosis in Rats. Um, so that's kind of a mouthful, but like the importance of it is what she got from her from her article. Um, so they were looking at two different treatments for Alzheimer's, and they ultimately found that a main cause of Alzheimer's is oxidative stress, and oxidative stress is caused by free radicals in your body. But they also found that free radicals are always in our body, whether we have Alzheimer's or not. But you shouldn't panic. That doesn't mean that you're going to get Alzheimer's. Um, and there are ways to reduce the number of free radicals in your bodies. And they didn't come up with a solidified um, reason or a way to get uh, rid of free radicals, but the number one reason they found that maybe would work um, was to eat antioxidants. And so what she talked about at the end was that it's really, really important to take care of our bodies. And so that's the theme that I'm going to take through my whole presentation, and I hope that by the end of your, my presentation, you understand why it's so important to exercise, eat healthy. So with that, my presentation is on the paper Exercise and Genetic Rescue of SCA1 via the Transcriptional Repressor Pathway. So in simpler terms, how exercise reduces the effects of SCA1, and SCA1 is a neurodegenerative disease. Um, so for those of you that are, um, I'm good friends with, you probably understand why I picked an article that had to do with exercise. Um, but for those of you that don't know me very well, I wanted to give you a little bit of background. So. This past year, well, I've been really, really um, interested in exercise and exercising and um, improving the shape of your body and being in shape for all the sports that we play. But in the past year, I've become really focused on keeping my body healthy because in August of this past year, my father passed away um, from a sudden stroke and he was a completely healthy. And I didn't bring it up just to like kind of make you sad or make you feel bad. But I brought it up because I've really, this past year, a um, big theme with my, with my life and my family's life was just keeping ourselves healthy, doing as much as we can to live life to the fullest. Um, so that's why I really just want to focus on exercise. So um, in this paper, they were looking at SCA1. SCA1 is a neurodegenerative disease. It's spinal cerebellar ataxia type 1. Um, it is associated mainly with the loss of motor coordination and balance, which is really important for the rest of the experiments. Also, speech and swallow swallowing difficulties, muscle stiffness, weakness in eye muscles, which leads to cognitive impairment, dystonia, which are muscle contractions, atrophy, which is the wasting away of your muscle. And the list doesn't stop here. This is just some of the things that happens when somebody has a CA1. So it's just so important to highlight how bad of a disease this actually is and how fatal it is. So that's how important it is to find a cure to this. So in the paper, they were looking at exercise. And exercise is defined by the activity requiring physical effort paired to sustain or improve health and fitness. Um, so I have a video here. Yeah. Just so you can kind of visualize through the um, paper what the mice were actually doing when they were exercising. So this is my exercising. <laughs> so I just want to give you a little bit of preview so you can actually visualize what was going on. So the scientists in this experiment were looking to see whether exercise would help the disease or make it worse. Um, and the way that it would make it worse was that the neurons in the brain that are being affected by, by the disease would be overexhausted from exercising so much. Um, and the thing to remember throughout all these experiments is that they're looking for the improvement of motor coordination. So just remember that. Um, so the first experiment they did was an exercise regimen. So they took four to eight week old mice and they had four groups. So when I refer to wild type, that's just regular mice did not have the disease. The 154Q mice are the mice that did have the disease but had not exercised previously. The wild type exercise are just wild type mice, so the regular mice that did not have the disease after exercising. 
and then the 154Q exercise mice are the mice that had the disease that had exercise. So they had an exercise regimen that was five times a week where they put them on a rotor rod or a treadmill. Um, and they actually did not find any improvement of motor coordination, but even though they didn't find this, they found something else. They found that the mice, after exercising with the disease, actually were living longer. So you can see here, so you can see the red line. This is the mice with the disease that had not previously exercised. So they lived for only about 275 days. But then you can see with the blue line, which are the mice with the disease that had exercised, they lived for almost 350 days. So even though they didn't find improvement in motor coordination, they found improvement in lifespan. So this is going to be important, important later in the paper. Everybody understand? Yeah? Okay. Um, so they wanted to see why they were living longer. So they cut out a piece of the brainstem of these mice a week after the workout regimen, and they found that there was an, a significant increase in their EGF, or the epidermal growth factor, and for those of you that don't know, EGF stimulates cell growth and proliferation. So since it's in the brain, cell, brain stem, it's thoroughly involved with your basic life function, so like breathing, your heart rate. So it would make sense that an increased level of their EGF would make them live longer because their basic life functions are working better. So just to solidify that, you can see that the wild time mice after exercise had a significant increase of their EGF, and so did the mice with the disease after exercising. Understand? All right? Yeah? Okay. So also, what they did is they cut out a piece of the cerebellum of all the mice after a week after the exercise regimen, and they found that unlike the EGF, or the epidermal growth factor, which increased, they found a decrease in CAPQA. And CAPQA is the main protein that they're focusing on in this experiment. And unlike EGF, it's a transcriptional repressor in the central nervous system, so when you have high levels of cavula, you have a loss in motor coordination and loss in basic life movements. And for those of you that don't know, the cerebellum is focused on your um, movement and balance. So this would make sense. If they have in, uh, increased levels of CIC, which happens when you have SCA1, they would have a lower ability to move. Does everybody understand that? So when they cut out the piece of the cerebellum, after exercise, you can see a significant decrease in the CIC levels. And then you can see also a significant decrease in the CIC levels of the mice who had the disease. Are you understand? <laughs> um, so then they did a Western blot, which is on the bottom. And this is just solidify and look at the levels of protein. So I want to focus on the top one. So as you can see, the wild type mice, so just the mice that did not have the disease, had a medium level of CIC levels. And then after exercise, they almost had no CIC in their brains. And then as you can see, the 154Q mice, or the mice with disease, had high levels of CIC, and after exercise, they had significantly lower levels of CIC. But the thing is, they found this, but they still haven't seen an increase in motor coordination. So as the paper goes on, they're going to talk about how CIC levels are um, involved within this experiment. Understand? Okay, so just things to take away so far so that you have a thorough understanding of what's going on. After they had exercise, you saw an increased level of EGF, your epidermal growth factor, which accounted for their increased lifespan. Um, and they also found a decreased levels of CIC in the cerebellum, but they still don't know what this is going to do with the mice. Um, so as we're talking about this, is this maybe the mechanism in exercise that's going to benefit humans? So by the end of the presentation, we're going to have a strong answer to this question. Okay. So now that they see that there's lower levels of CIC, they wanted to see actually what these low levels of CIC are going to do with the mice. So they had two um, fitness regimens. The first one was an open field regimen, and that just means they had an open field and just let the four groups of mice just run. Um, so here they were looking for distance, so I want to focus on these two. The red bar signifies the mice that had the disease that had not previously been on the fitness regimen. So they only went about 4,000 centimeters, which is very low. But then you can see <coughs> the blue bar, these are the mice with the disease that had gone on the fitness regimen earlier in the paper. They significantly went up um, in their distance. They went up to almost 6,000 centimeters. And since they went farther, that means that they have an increased level of motor coordination. 
So now they're starting to pull together what lower levels of CIC mean when in the brain. Understand? Okay. Um, and the second experiment they did, this is actually the video that they saw that we saw in the beginning of the paper. They weren't looking for distance here, they were looking for time. So they were trying to see um, how long it took them to fall off the treadmill or rotor rod. That's the video that we saw. Um, so the red line signifies the mice that had that had the disease but that had not previously exercised. So it did not take them a long time to fall off the rotor rod. But then if you compare this to the blue line, that those are the mice that have <coughs> disease that had previously exercised. It took them a lot more time to fall off, which means that they are able to run um, more easily, which means they have higher motor coordination. <laughs> okay, and so the last thing they looked at were Purkinje cells. Um, Purkinje cells are the largest neurons in the human brain. And in SCA1, which is the disease we're looking at, they're the first cells to show dysfunction. So what they did is they look at, they look at the, um, one of the cells in each of the four mice. So the ones to look at are these bottom two. ATXM1 mice are the mice with the disease, and you can see that they have very, very low levels of the Purkinje cells, which would make sense because they have low levels of motor coordination and their life are a lot shorter. And then if you compare it to the right, these are the mice with the disease that have low levels of CIC. They have a significant larger amount of Purkinje cells. So as they exercise more, their Purkinje cells are growing and they're having a growth in their motor coordination. Yeah. Do you know where the brain that is? Um, I believe it's the cerebellum, but I'm not positive. Somewhere in the brain. <laughs> I'm not positive though. <laughs> How do I understand? Okay. So the big picture, what they found from this. Exercise leads to the increase of your epidermal growth factor, which accounts for the increased lifespan, also a decrease in the CIC levels in the brain, and then led to an increase in Purkinje cells, and all this together leads to an increase in motor coordination and lifespan of SCA1 mice. Everybody understand that? Okay. So what the scientists concluded. So although they were first looking for improvement of motor coordination in the mice, they did not find this, but this is not important. It's important that they found that they also had an increase in lifespan. So this is important for exercise because this means it's multifaceted, that it can do many things within the body. Um, so it's safe to say that exercise early in disease course would be beneficial to these patients. And the question that they want to take next and take the next step further is can we extend this to a variety of neurodegenerative diseases? Yeah. <coughs> Because the SCA1, which is the disease we're looking at, the first thing they lose is, mo is their loss of motor coordination. So they'll be able to see whether it helps or makes it worse by looking at their motor coordination. Um, and then, so I didn't want to really stop here. I wanted to take it one step further. <coughs> um, so I talked to Mr. D, and we discussed this paper a little bit more in depth. Um, and we wanted to see how does this mechanism within exercise connect to us. So despite all of our medical solutions, a lot of our solutions to these diseases or just in general to our general health are found in nature. So something like exercise can increasingly help our bodies. So as I said early in the paper, genetics and heritability we cannot control, but we can control the amount we're exercising or the effects that exercise have on our body. So now that we have found the mechanism within exercise and what's actually happening within the bodies, is there a way that we can take this mechanism and put it in a bottle and call it exercise in a bottle so people can maybe take this instead of actually having to go to the gym and getting the effects of exercise? That's like the conclusion, like once they find, once they have found this mechanism and they're able to make it into maybe a medicine or a solution, they have to figure out if it's legal actually to be able to take something like this. Yeah. So you don't know what the mechanism is that whatever happens to your body when you exercise, how that ends up affecting the disease, what it is that... Well, we've identified that the mechanism within is the EGF goes up and the CIC levels go down. And we found that in mice, but the next step is to connect this to humans and find the exact mechanism that's happening in humans. 
But we don't know how exercise changes those levels, what it is about. Not specifically, no. There's a concept that humans should have a limit, right? There's a normal limit to what a human should be able to achieve. You see it when you're prescribing drugs like ADD drugs, um, and you see it when things like steroids are banned. That there is a certain amount of good that you can become, and you shouldn't be more than that. So, for example, a track athlete can become a faster sprinter if they take steroids. But we've kind of said, no, you shouldn't be allowed to do that. You shouldn't be allowed to enhance your body with drugs. Now, this is essentially saying the same thing, but in a more healthy way. Right? There's a lot of negative benefits or negative aspects to steroid use. Um, you would likely not see as many of the unhealthy side effects with this drug. Um, so, should you be allowed? Should anyone be allowed to take this? They prescribe steroids. They do. But isn't this more like it would have the same effect as if you exercise and everyone can exercise? That's not like not allowed. I feel like it's more of like would the whole world just become lazy and never get off the cap? But you can't exercise all day. Theoretically, you could exercise for six hours a day, take some pills, and have the effect of exercising twelve hours a day. Should you be allowed to do that? I mean, it's not just the Olympics we ban people from, right? It's not just that's not the cap. It's not sprinting only. I mean, if you think about performance in school or intellect, ADD drugs do show benefit to people that don't have ADD. But we've said, no, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be allowed to have that bump in improvement in performance. Somebody else say something. <laughs> 